Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. One thing that Bill Belichick does is he makes practice extremely difficult. Like he wets the balls because he wants people to try and fumble. He makes the grass really tall so it's harder for people to run. Like all the elements that you have within that practice are abnormal and things that you don't necessarily experience during a game. Just so when you actually get to the game, it's a lot easier. So in context of a seller, if you're the BDR who gets a call script, and you're sitting in a room and just like practicing it on your own. And granted, sometimes you don't have someone to practice with. But if you're just practicing it on your own and trying to refine it, that's not a realistic situation or even a situation that is going to really press you. So what I encourage my team to do is like when you're doing role plays, like come at the person with the strongest objections. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Ernest Owusu, and Ernest is the Senior Director of Sales Development at Sixth Sense. And in this episode, I talk with Ernest about, well, let's see. First of all, we talk about fatherhood. Ernest and his wife had triplets not that long ago, two boys and a girl. You have to admit, that's a pretty crazy way to kick off a pandemic. We talk about football. Ernest was a star football player at Cal Berkeley and a former player in the NFL. And we talk about his unusual journey from professional football to professional sales. And I also ask him this question, will he let his sons play football? Well, you have to stick around to hear his answer on that. Now, sometimes people feel like the whole sports sales connection is overplayed, and perhaps sometimes it is. But however, I feel these are both performance-based professions, and there's a lot that carries over from one to the other. And Ernest shares ideas on some of the disciplines that he's carried over from his career in sports, including one I really love, is that you have to practice with the same intensity that you play. I love that idea. And we also exchange ideas on how to put that into practice. So stick around. Another very interesting conversation. Before we get to Ernest, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it with Ernest. Ernest, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Well, yeah, we we finally made it happen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of coordination, a lot of going back and forth, emails, calls, <laughs> all that. Happy here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, let's get to the most important thing first, which is that you and your wife had triplets recently. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. It's been quite the handful, to say the least. <laughs> I can imagine. So, two boys and one girl. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yep. And so, the names are? Yeah, sure. So, Louis, Henry, yeah. and Ruthie. Yeah. So, Louis oh, like the whole like, IE kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but classic, classic names, though. Louis, Henry, and Ruthie. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Now, are they identical? Yeah. So the boys are identical. Obviously the girls not, but uh, yeah, so they yeah. look very much alike, but it's funny. Cause like, even though, you know, they're still so young and they have a lot more to grow, uh, we can very easily pick them apart. Um, but I don't know how much longer it's going to be. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I guess that raises the question is, you know, triplets, they probably all have distinct personalities. And I imagine are you, you're, are you able to sort of, to your last points or sort that out? Yeah, honestly, already. Because, I mean, they're right now, they'll be six months in about three days, but uh, you can very easily see kind of what they're probably going to be like. Uh, Ruthie, the girl, is like very calm, cerebral, um, very patient. <laughs> Louis, <laughs> Louis is probably the one who's going to be our uh, our fighter, the energetic one. And then and then, and then then Henry's just really happy all the time. So it's funny how you can kind of catch that early on, but we're already loving it. Yeah, well, you're sort of learning something that, that usually – Parents don't learn until they have their second child if they only have one the first time, which is that they just come out differently. Exactly. And <laughs> I was telling a story with 
with my son is my oldest who actually is my producer. He just met him. And um, yeah, he was easy baby, right? Slept early. I mean, or slept through the night early you know, after just like five, six weeks going all the way through. Um, <laughs> yeah. Happy go lucky. And we thought, gosh, when we have the next one, we'll do it the exact same way. So when his sister came, we said, yeah, we're just going to do it just the way we did it with Alec. <laughs> yeah. Didn't matter. <laughs> didn't matter. Different person came out a different person was having none of that. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great if we could predict it. We knew, we knew exactly what was going to be, how it'd be, but uh, yeah. That's how it was. All right. So you're getting any sleep? Uh, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> but, but I will say my, my wife and I have a pretty good, uh, we're, we're both athletes and obviously we come with like a very regimented background. So, um, we're both pretty aligned on a schedule to follow to make sure we're trying to get as much sleep as possible, but still it's not quite happening the way I'd like it to be. So, so you were a football player and we're going to get into that in a little bit. So what, what sport was your wife from? Uh, indoor volleyball. She's actually, uh, the head beach volleyball coach at Cal right now. So, uh, still very, uh-huh. nice. yep. Mm-hmm. Wait, so beach volleyball is now a NCAA sport? It is, yeah. So she started the program, I'd say, maybe six years ago. Um, so yeah, but it's an NCAA uh-huh. sport. It's one of the fastest growing right now. Didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. Hadn't kept track of that. Yeah. All right. So a question I usually ask guests is, what's the biggest lesson you've learned about yourself during the pandemic? But for you, I have a special version of that question, which is, what's the biggest lesson you've learned about yourself as a new father? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are like, even before this, a lot of us are just sprinting, like taking things as they were and kind of not taking the opportunity to look at things as they should be. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, as me, who was eventually going to be a new father, I knew that I was going to have to slow down a little bit because I wanted to um, spend more time with my family. And um, now that I'm home and I'm getting the opportunity to be a lot closer with them, I could literally jump out of this after this this podcast go out and just hold my kids um it's starting to make me realize how much more time i need to dedicate to my family myself just even outside of work um and that's probably a combination of all things covid but especially the fact that i'm just a new dad and um i'm looking forward to seeing what that's going to be like when all this is over because uh, a lot of these things that i have right now in terms of how much time i give my family how much i value it um i don't want (laughs) to lose those after this well yeah yeah that was gonna gonna be my next question is what happened <laughs> when things start getting back to normal. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. But one thing I will say, though, is I was the, the kind of person who never, ever worked from home. I just never did it. Um, I don't foresee myself having a structure where I don't do that at least once or twice a week after this. Uh, just because yeah. I'm starting to really realize how much time I get to spend with my family if I do that. Well, I think it's one of the great things about this era. I mean, and I say that, you know, very hesitantly. It's not, none of this is good, right? But in terms of a lesson people are learning, I think companies are learning, is that, yeah, I think this blended, more flexible approach to work is a way you're going to get more out of your people. You know, have giving people the flexibility to work remotely from two days a week and, and know that it's not the end of the world, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, my wife's work, uh, you know, an academic institution, resisted forever remote work for anybody mm-hmm. oh it just doesn't work and mm-hmm. then suddenly they were forced to have everybody remote and it's like oh well maybe it works it, it's exactly like, well yeah i mean you get i think you're gonna get more out of your employees and not from an expl- exploitative way but just you know people would just be more naturally productive because to your point they're feeling a little more balanced they get a little more in touch with with families i think especially for people that the travel, I always found that the hard part. I wanted to, because I traveled extensively mm-hmm. uh, for many, many years of my career, all around the world, constantly. And um, yeah, I'd get back from a trip and had to show up at the office the next day. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's like, <laughs> I wasn't a great day to work from home. Now, we didn't really always at those times have the technology to do that, but it was still, um, I, I would have valued it. And I'm sure a lot of people are in your situation where it's like, yeah, I don't need to be remote all the time, but. If I can have that opportunity to do it a couple of days a week, it'd be great. Yeah, and it's gonna be really interesting too because you know we're gonna have a very large sample size depending on when this thing finally finishes. <laughs> yes, it's gonna yeah. be like what actually happens when you have your entire workforce working remotely if, if you get the opportunity to do so. So uh, the business decisions that are gonna happen after this, based upon that, are gonna be really interesting to see. I, I'm, yeah, I'm forward to that. Well, because people didn't sign up for remote work. Uh, this is one thing that I keep coming back to. It's like, okay, great, people have been hugely adaptable by Mm -hmm. and large, right? Mm -hmm. Across this country in all professions, we said, look, you got to work remotely. 
that's not the way most people want to work. It's mm-hmm. not the way I think most people are productive mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is they want to go to an office. They want to be with colleagues. They want to collaborate in person. They want to do these things that are, are more personal. And yeah, I think given the opportunity, if companies don't foreclose that just for the virtue of saving money on rent, mm-hmm. which I think would be foolish, is yeah, do this blended thing. Mm-hmm. Completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, as I started touching on this, so for people who don't know, you were you were a star football player at Cal Berkeley. Yes, I was. It was a lot of fun. And, <laughs> well, as a loyal Stanford alum. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I not sure I can really. <laughs> I won't hold it against not, you. <laughs> I'm not really sure I go with that Go Bears thing, but. Uh, <laughs> You guys have won at least one big game in the last three decades, right? Well, I think we've won the most recent one. Okay, oh. so two, two out, two out of the last twenty years. Okay, good. Um, all right, we had to get, we had to do that. We had to get that out of the way. It's obligatory when Stanford person, and Cal person talks together. <laughs> now, I do have to ask though: Are you any relationship at all to Francis Owusu? Interestingly enough, no, I don't, because. Um, the last name Owusu is by far one of the most common last names in uh, the country that both our parents came from. And funny, his brother, Chris, we were actually right. teammates together in Tampa Bay. So that was the first time I've actually had <laughs> a teammate with uh, the same last name as me. But no relationship. We are all – we're pretty close, Chris and I at least. Uh, but I get that all the time. <laughs> now, well, I knew you weren't. I'd, I'd looked that up before. But um, – but you realize why I was asking about Francis, one of the greatest catchers in college football oh, history. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. You, you remember the one, right? Oh, Against I UCLA. Remember. I definitely remember. Yeah. I mean, for people who don't know, look it up on YouTube. Francis Owusu, <laughs> catch against UCLA uh, for a touchdown where basically he's he's falling backwards, facing the direction the ball's coming from, the quarterback, has his arms around a defender, and he catches a ball behind the defender's back. <laughs> Should not have that. The ground. It was amazing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So geeking out a little bit about that, but so you were defensive end. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. And uh, all academic Pac-12. I was. I was. It was. Uh, I mean, that's honestly part of the reason why I, why I chose Cal. Um, just of course. Make, yeah. Great education. Exactly. I mean, we'll knock it as a Stanford alum. I can knock it, but it is a fantastic education. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And your major was uh, political economy. So, um, you know, interestingly, I wanted to try and find. I knew football wasn't always going to be a thing that um, right. I to retire eventually. So, um, I saw that the mix between poli sci and economics was something I was interested in, and that's kind of why I chose that. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, I sort of think about that as I was, you know, doing research for this this interview. I thought, well, that's no, about as relevant as my history degree. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but good background for for sales, I thought, because you know one of the real things that was stressed in the history degree was, you know, analytical thinking. Exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, good good grounding. So, curious now, and I have a connection to sales for asking this, but mm-hmm. so were you drafted by the pros? No, I was not. So I, interestingly enough, so I had the opportunity to do a ton of visits with teams. Um, right. And the way the process goes is sometimes they call you and say they're going to draft you, but they actually don't because someone else becomes available. Um, yeah. so I, I got a couple of those, I guess, ghost calls, if you want to call them, but at the end of the day, I ended up going undrafted. But uh, one thing that people don't really realize is when you are kind of like in those later rounds, especially if you're eventually going to be a sixth or seventh rounder, it's actually better to go undrafted because you can choose your team as opposed to going somewhere that ah. you want to go. So because I was kind of one of those fringe guys that was like sixth, seventh round, potentially like a, a preferred free agent. Um, I had about 14 teams that I could have chosen to go to, and I chose the Vikings based upon their roster, the organization, et cetera. Now, did you go to the Combine? I, so I actually I, I did my pro day, but my numbers, um, <laughs> what I will say, um, had I gone, would have been top three almost on every single board, which is pretty cool to kind of hang my hat on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so did you do like that Wonderlick test and the in-depth interviews they do on all of that? Yeah. So they, they actually, they hosted most of those at Cal, which was great. Um, and the whole, the whole process is actually pretty crazy. If you think about it. Um, I didn't really realize it while I was going through it, but like they, 
the amount of analysis that you're doing with like your personal life, your injuries, like everything. It's just kind of weird the product, like how they're putting you through all of that. Um, but yeah, I went through all of it. It was it was a blast. It was interesting in a lot of different ways, but I enjoyed it. Well, I've written about this before because I'm always fascinated by this process. The pros go through to evaluate pro football to mm-hmm. to evaluate. You know, <laughs> kids coming out of college mm-hmm. for basically it's a job interview for your first job. Exactly, and and there's this amazing rigor that's applied to it from mm-hmm. this test and the interviews and so on. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, when you look at the statistics, is yeah, you know, high draft choices mm-hmm. typically don't succeed very well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly, and it's and it's like, huh? So what's that tell us about? what we do to hire sales reps. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I, mean, I, I think I have the answer to that, you know. Oh yeah, go ahead, please, please. Honestly, when you look at how people get drafted and how people um, select their their preferred salesperson, people find comfort in tangible things. You find comfort in the fact that there's that one person who went to an Ivy League school, they went through sales training programs, they have 2 years worth of sales experience because you know that typically is an indication of success. You have, you know, in the NFL, it's if that one person we're at a four three, and they went to Alabama, and they have all the check marks, all the check marks, check sorry, check boxes marked. Yeah, yeah. Um, then obviously that gives you a lot more comfortable. But the reality is, there are a lot of really strong, intangible qualities that people have that are typically a lot better indicators of success, but they're just a lot more difficult to measure. And that's the reason why, in my opinion, when you see uh, sales hires or you know draft picks, that's why people make mistakes because they're not as willing to be as comfortable. With relying on the intangibles. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was thinking about my my interview process for my first first job. I mean, part of it was the <laughs> the sales manager really wanted to hire me, mm-hmm. um, but the branch manager of this large computer company I was going to work for, who had the ultimate say, he took a little bit of convincing because yeah, he had never. He was sort of the opposite. You know, he was sort of suspicious of mm-hmm. <laughs> people from Stanford. <laughs> He's like, eh, you're all going to go to law school or business school. And then I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get any time from you. And yeah, I just want to hire someone from you know, a local Cal State school because they do great. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, yeah, you can have all the things checked out. Like four or three from Alabama. and think, okay, that's a safer choice. But Sometimes people, and to his credit, the ranch manager said, "Yeah, there's more to it than that. Let's let's dig down deeper." Mm-hmm. I, I completely agree. And honestly, with the teams that I hire, um, so we have our criteria that we look for uh, for like the birth, the perfect SDR BDR candidate. And the reality is, like we we assess people for like the qualities of like how well they can they can talk, they can write, they, their business acumen. But a lot of like the the main principles or characteristics are intangibles. And um, yeah, it's uncomfortable to try and assess that. And like people even kind of build out those assessment profiles that they uh, use to kind of get a sense of what those qualities might be. But uh, personally, I don't really care if you went to Stanford, if you went to another school, if you have the experience or not, like if you're whatever, as long as you possess those, those intangible qualities that we're looking for, those are the people that typically, in my opinion, at least um, lead to success, the success that you're expecting. Yeah. I mean, it's at this moment, you know, hiring a new salesperson as their first job, or in your case, you know, your first job was playing football, but in either case, it's a crapshoot, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you're, you're, you're to your point about the intangibles and I, which I agree with hundred percent is that there's nothing, usually there's nothing very tangible, <laughs> at least in, from a sales perspective mm-hmm. that you can hang your hat on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somebody, I mean, yeah, I worked in a retail store. I did, you know, there's little things perhaps, but yeah, they tend not to translate. It's, it's so much of it is gut feeling, which, mm-hmm. um, you know, some studies will say, well, <laughs> don't rely on your gut gut instinct. There's one study that's showing people interviewing for jobs and a sort of a control group. And one, um, Looked at the resume, reviewed, and then gave, yeah, you know, had the people in for interviews. And the other was we just hired people based on what we saw on their resume. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the ones that hired on the resume actually performed higher than those that <laughs> they brought in an interview because, yeah, you know, people did get their emotions involved. So like I said it is this real this real crapshoot for mm-hmm. entry level jobs. And I I'm not sure. I think it'll always be that way. I mean, I'm I'm not a big fan of you know personality assessments and some of those other things. I, mm-hmm. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I was 
Somebody asked me once what I thought my success record was with new hires and entry level jobs. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember, but I'm sure is no no better than anybody else. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to see that for a lot of people as well and kind of how uh, they're grading themselves based on what's actually happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I, I mean, I, the thing is, I remember the failures much more than the successes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've hired people into jobs that, that, we're not entry level job. In this case, the stories are we're not about entry level jobs, but people that were stellar performers at other companies came with you know, high recommendations. People I knew and trusted that showed up in and the environment that we were in, and it just didn't work. Yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. didn't work in a dramatic fashion. And the, and the, this is, I think, the thing that makes it so hard about hiring, whether it's entry level or not, it, whatever, is just context is everything. Exactly. One thing that I kind of try and do, and obviously this is a little bit easier said than done, is uh, when when I'm interviewing people, if there's that one thing that I'm just like really not okay with, and someone spends X amount of the the interview uh, like demonstrating that, in my head I'm like, okay, am I actually going to be able to accept the fact that this person is going to do that? Say say 10% of the interview they're talking about like how they don't get along with their their teammates or how they're not Mm -hmm. comfortable. If someone's doing that with 10% of the time they're talking to me, they're going to do that with 10% of the time they're working in my company. So if I'm okay with that, then I'll I'll take it. But if I'm not okay with it, I just absolutely can't make a decision on that. No matter where your sales team is working from, RingDNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. RingDNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with RingDNA. Learn more about how RingDNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. Yeah, well, I think, well, you have to pay attention to the red flags. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, if you don't, what you're doing is settling. Mm-hmm. And every decision, to some degree, is a compromise, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's a big believer in this. You know, they're all basically good enough decisions. But to your point, is you have to decide which are the ones that you just can't yeah. accept. And it's, it's true of relationships in general, right? I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> you sort of have to put it in that context. Exactly. Exactly. Couldn't agree anymore. All right. So I have one last, I want to ask one last football related question because I, before we go on, but so, um, would you let your sons play football? That's a great question. (laughs) Um, at the moment, no. And I will say as a defensive end, because there are two on the field, this was Mm -hmm. literally my dream, my entire life to have two boys same age, <laughs> like same position, watching both at the same time. So, like, it's kind of like cruel that I got this, but um, you know, at the current moment, no. And a lot of that stems from the fact that um, when I first finished playing football, I worked at a company called Prasado, and um, mm-hmm. you know, part of the whole football environment is like very much of a warrior mentality where you kind of ignore things and don't embrace them for what they are. And um, honestly, you know, even in the professional ranks, you I mean, was, like. Like concussions and head injuries. And things like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, w- with concussions and head injuries, I did not pay any attention to it while I was playing because I saw it as one thing that was going to prevent me from playing. It was something that was going to slow me down. So uh, when I had my first interview after finishing football, um, I had no sales experience. So I, my VP of sales was like, hey, I want you to sell me anything. Uh, obviously, all I knew was football. So I went down that path of like doing research on helmets and concussions. And I was like, did I really just do that to myself for the past what, 15, 16 years? <laughs> so it was, it was very, very eye opening to the point that, um, you know, under the certain the conditions that we have right now, I can't let my kids play, unfortunately. Um, not to say that things couldn't change where, you know, you know, protocol and practice and helmets can improve, but if it's like this, unfortunately, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, there, there are a lot of sports for, for kids. So um, swimming. For instance, very, very low <laughs> head head injury risk in swimming. <laughs> yeah. uh, or volleyball, for instance, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It'll be tough. I will okay. say it'll, it'll be tough because obviously, you know, I play, so they're going to want to play, but I just can't do that. Yeah. Well, maybe they won't want to. I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing is, you know, kids, they get their own interests. So, um, yeah. So, you're out of football. You'd, you'd serve after, what, Vikings, Tampa Bay, Canadian mm-hmm. football league. Do you actually 
play in the Canadian Football League? Yeah, I did. And the CFL is a real, it's like the, the rules are completely different. The field is Yeah, I love it. It's like it's a whole different game. And I had no exposure until I had the opportunity to go up there. Uh, but to your point, so I was with the Vikings, the Buccaneers. Then I got really badly injured with the Buccaneers. Took a couple months off. Uh, tried getting back onto an NFL team. It didn't happen. So then I started going the uh, Canadian football and even the arena route to try and get back onto a team. Uh, just basically to build my resume, show people that I wasn't hurt. Um, and then honestly, at the end of the day, when it was like I realized that there was no way I was going to get back in because I was more of damaged goods, if you want to call it, to everyone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of when I made the decision to stop playing. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> the her serve was a moment. And I was wondering, was that like CFL, AFL, or is just like, Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this isn't gonna got- happen. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. funny because, like, I the last AFL team I was on, I was 26, turning 27, and though obviously I'm I'm still young, relatively young at that right. time in football years, you're like middle age, and I was like, there's no way a middle aged football player is gonna get back onto a team with an injury. So I was like, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, you still look incredibly young. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's told you that, but <laughs> I, I think it's it's the lack of facial hair that I grow. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Because the first time we talked, I looked at you and said, "Oh, you have, you probably had the same problem I did when I first got into sales. I looked like I was 12. <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite been able to fight that off. But in due time, like, oh. <laughs> so so why sales? So, yeah, it's a great question. Um, honestly. I think a lot of, especially football players, professional football players, are always struggling trying to figure out what they want to do next. Um, and for me, like I kind of hit that crossroads when I was done of like, all right, there's no, I don't want to be a coach because uh, the only way I'd get fulfillment if I was doing the uh, college level, college level, or uh, in the NFL. But the right. hours as a coach, you're doing like a hundred hours per week. It's, it's a really demanding job. Um, so I knew I didn't want to do that, but I wanted to find a way to take the skills that got me to the NFL and apply them to something else and. Honestly, I just did a lot of talking to people after the fact to talk to people in wealth management and finance and all these different industries. And all science just started pointing towards sales because of kind of what I did as an athlete and kind of how I can parlay that into a successful career. And, you know, honestly, I just took a big leap of faith based upon uh, what research I'd done as well as recommendations from people. And I've been extremely happy ever since. Was it sort of part of the mindset of thinking, well, I'd been an elite athlete and sales is like one of those professions where... Yeah, the top performers are like elite athletes. And the path to get there oftentimes is like being an elite athlete. 100%. And it's, I, I knew that you know when I was an athlete, I worked really hard. I was very coachable. I was very process-driven in terms of how I made myself better. And what I, I mean, I already knew that before I even started thinking about what I was going to do next. So when I was talking to people about how I did that, all signs point towards toward sales because the great salespeople have the ability to do that. Um, and it was just basically a no brainer once I uh, started to realize that. So the disciplines then that you brought over from sports that helped you in sales, I mean, obviously you talked about preparation being mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. Um, mindset obviously has to be part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, process along with that, I imagine is, is also important. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I can even talk about this one thing and I know people might think this is a little crazy, but, um, when I was a BDR, I was on the West coast working East coast accounts. There's, mm-hmm. there's an industry best practice to call them in the morning. So I started something, which I actually still do to this day of getting into the office at five thirty every morning. Cause I wanted to put myself in the best situation to be successful. So sure. I, I have not deviated from that. And like, I, I'm very well aware of the certain things that yield towards success. And once I kind of pull those out, I'm not going to change my process or um, steer away from that. So I think athletics allowed me to be extremely disciplined in that front. But one thing that's pretty cool that a lot of people don't really think about is just the process. Um, to be a great athlete, um, you, I, I think I was even talking to a couple people about this a couple days ago, but most great athletes have like this one thing they do better than every single person else. And mm-hmm. once you kind of identify what that one thing, it's like constantly optimizing it, making it better, tweaking it, learning how you can improve upon it. And a lot of my processes, I, I, once I have the framework built out, and this is probably my biggest strength as, as a seller, but like once I have the framework around what makes me good at a certain task or a certain set of tasks, I outline it and just like poke it to death trying to find anything you can do to make it better. And um, right. that's kind of how I've been able to succeed as a seller. So besides showing up early, what's that one thing for you? <laughs> um, besides showing up early, I mean, it's, it's definitely, like I said, it's, it's more the process. Like, you know, even from when I was a BDR, it's like how I called people from the intro to your pitch to your clothes. Like 
I was voraciously always trying to find ways to improve just those, those tiny three segments. And the same thing as a seller in terms of how I'm motivating my team, in terms of how I'm tracking towards metrics, hitting my goals. Like once I understand what it takes to be great at those, I just keep going. So it, it's never really like it, it's more of just the overall process and looking for ways to improve. That's always made me great. It's not really that like I'm a great caller or I'm a great uh, right. closer or anything like that. It's just like, I I'm very focused on the process all around. Well, but it displays a lot. And I think this is an important lesson for sellers to learn is that it sounds like what you've done. And, and this is absolutely what you need to do is you analyzed sort of in advance, but you continually do it as what do I need to do to really excel at this? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you said you put your process together when you start. We all have started. We have no idea what we're doing when we get started. But if you sort of create that framework and say, look, I'm just going to keep improving. I'm be consciously improving, not just sort of going through the motions and hope that I get better through experience, but I'm consciously going through it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a huge separation from those people that consistently succeed versus those that just sort of get along. Yeah, and, and one thing I do want to add to that, too, is um, it's really important to know why those things work for you because if you're the kind of person exactly who's, if you're the kind of person who's constantly searching for like that new thing or like a new strategy new tactic whatever it may be and you're applying it to your process just because you're hearing that it's working and you don't really know like how that applies to your process that can be a problem in itself so like there's definitely an aspect of selecting what you should take on versus what you shouldn't take on but your ability to do that is contingent upon whether or not you actually understand how you're winning with that process and i think at times especially people that are new in their career they struggle with that a little bit we said understand how you're winning. I, I would just modify that to align with what you said before is understand why you're winning. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's really the why. And and this is to me is the fundamental shortfall with most of the training we provide to sales reps, uh, sellers in general, as sales managers even, is it's always about how to do things, but never why these things work. Mm-hmm. Right. And and the fact is that yeah, you know, if I teach a class to, to somebody and I said, you yeah, know, this is why this works. You know, it may not work that way for everyone mm-hmm. in the same way, but you give people the rationales to then a context as to why these things are effective. Not just, you know, we looked at some data and you know, 26% of people reply to this or respond to this. It's like, no, nah, this is, you know, everything to your point, everybody develops their own unique way of doing things. You mm-hmm. just have to be thoughtful about it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you, you wrote something interesting was re- I liked recently. Is you said that um, you have to practice with the same intensity that you play. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a soccer, <laughs> played soccer in college and, and a soccer, huge soccer fan. And, and this is really one of the, the hallmarks of uh, you know, professional soccer, professional football <laughs> in, in mm-hmm. the Europe, is that everything's based on how intense you, you train. Yep. You have to train at 100%. You practice at 100%. So how do, you, how do you bring that into a sales context to say, we're going to practice with sort of game intensity? Yeah, sure. So I can give you an example that I learned from well, in the NFL as well as what I, t- what I teach on BDRs. So mm-hmm. one thing that was really cool from the Patriots is, uh, you know, in, in NFL training camps, you get the opportunity to kind of do some cross-team um, practices. So I got to spend right. some time with the Patriots uh, just for about a week or so, kind of watching their practices, practicing against them. One thing that Bill Belichick does is he makes practice extremely difficult. Like he wets the balls because he, he wants people to try and fumble. He makes the grass really tall. So it's harder for people to mm-hmm. run. Like all the elements that you have within that practice are abnormal and things that you don't necessarily uh, experience during a game. Just so when you actually get to the game, it's a lot easier. So in context of a seller, like if you're the BDR who gets a call, gets a call script and you're sitting in a room and just like, you know, practicing it on your own and granted, sometimes we don't have someone to practice with, but if you're just practicing it on your own and trying to refine it, that's not a realistic situation or even a situation that is going to, is going to really press you. So what I encourage my team to do is like when you're doing role plays, like come at the person with the strongest objections with, with anything possible that's going to, that's going to throw them off because when they get to the actual call, if they're prepared to handle even more difficult situations at times, um, then it'll be a lot easier for them to perform because they've kind of gone through already. But a lot of the practice that people do in terms of like their first calls, negotiation calls, alignment, whatever it may be, uh, they're not really going live bullets. They're not really taking these calls on as, uh, like preparing to fail, if you if you say, and mm-hmm. as that they kind of sell them short, short sell them short a little bit. Well, I think that going along with that though too is, and I know in some sports, and I, I presume it's. 
true in football as well, is, is visualization before you, mm-hmm. before a game, before you know a shot in golf or before a shot in basketball or whatever, is so important. And mm-hmm. people don't do that enough in sales. So I agree with you 100% on the role play intensity. But I think part of it too is in call preparation mm-hmm. is – you have to take a few seconds, and I know it's hard because people think, oh, God, I'm under such pressure to make my 50 calls, but yeah, I'd rather you made 30 really good calls as mm-hmm. opposed to 50 calls. But play through all the what-ifs and if-thens that mm-hmm. you can envision that will happen in this call based on what you know about this account, if it's, especially if it's not a first call and you've got some background, how it's going to play out, what what are all the variables that could occur. And you can do that in just a few minutes, just sort of think through that. To me, that's part of this practicing with intensity as well. Is is you have to bring this this uh, you have to be deliberate and thoughtful about sales. And this is this is yeah, I think a part that a lot of sellers miss is this is a really a thinking person's profession. One hundred percent. And actually, I'll definitely take that away because uh, that was a practice that I had as football in football, where I'd sit down before, the night before or day of and just kind of visualize myself making plays. And I did it a little bit when I was in SDR BDR, but I've definitely gone away from that. So. Um, I appreciate the call on that, so I'm definitely going to take it back to my team and share it with them. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah, just give me the credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the other thing that I thought was interesting and uh, that you'd written recently, which I I liked, is you you talked about people publicly shaming salespeople. Mm-hmm. You wrote about this on LinkedIn. So, so tell us what you meant by that. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny how, you know, even with LinkedIn, even introducing the stories recently, right? It's funny how LinkedIn is evolving, and um, for it's some, Facebook. It, it's <laughs> it, it's basically Facebook. It, it slowly turned into a networking system, but now it is literally what am I doing outside of work and work? It's that's social media and it's full, not just with work. Um, but you know, I, I'm starting to see that people are posting things in the hopes of gaining attention while putting people down. And there's absolutely no room for that. I I don't understand how or why. And even at certain times, people are doing these in in inaccurate scenarios just for the sake of gaining attention for calling someone out for doing something wrong. And like the reason why I have a problem with that in particular with salespeople, because you're supposed to be failing in sales. Like you have to fail. If you're not failing, you're not growing. So if something's happening on, on social media, where we're making it okay for people to um, shame people for do, literally doing what they're supposed to be doing and failing fast. That does not align with what it takes to be a successful salesperson. It also, make, it also makes it really difficult for those earlier salespeople to have the confidence to keep going forward. And I, I just don't understand why that has become an accepted norm on social media. It's, it's just completely counterproductive to uh, what salespeople need to be successful. Yeah, I think there's a corollary to that that goes on too, which is that, and I've seen this recently, is calling out on LinkedIn, calling out, and I'll put this in air quotes, sales experts Mm -hmm. for supposedly giving bad advice. Mm -hmm. And my thought is, my perspective on sales is that you know, if there's 7 billion people in the world, there's 7 billion different ways to sell. Mm -hmm. And and who's to judge what's, what's good or bad? Because... You know, I obviously have an audience and I talk about what I think people should do, but I know it doesn't work for 100% of the people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, it doesn't make a bad advice. It's just, there's great advice for some people and it's not going to work for others. And I think that's in sales, we have to get past this idea that there are absolutes and that there are recipes because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. there are no one recipe that works for every every seller. Exactly. Uh, you, have to, you have to make your own. And and that's what it all comes down to is because people in sales, people just find comfort in data. They come, they find comfort in knowing there's a silver bullet behind everything. And like, if there was a silver bullet, if there was an exact way to do it every single time, then we would not be unique as sellers. We'd be robots. <laughs> you, you wouldn't yeah. you'd meet sellers because there isn't, there's a solution that's in hand that everyone can use and should repackage and it works every single time. You would not need sellers at the scale that you need right now. The reality is you need that dynamic aspect. You need that creativity that sometimes can't be replicated based upon um, different scenarios or um, whatever it may be. And people kind of they lose sight of that because they're looking for a way to just find comfort in the fact that if I do X, Y, and Z, no matter what, I'll win, which, you know, for, at least for what I see in the near future of sales, that will not be the case. Yeah. Well, no, it won't be. And yes, there is this tendency, I think, in newer sellers these days because of the technology we have to say, yeah, there must be this data tells me right. this is the way to do it. 
And the trouble with so much of the data that's published about sales is it's completely without context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so somebody can say, look, we've analyzed a bazillion phone calls. And if you say these three words at this particular point, you're going to increase your ability to, you know, <laughs> probability of winning. I mean, there's a list of 20 variables that affect that, mm-hmm. at least. Yep. Uh, you're yeah, calling, so, spoken before. Is it, exactly. Well, is, is a male seller, a female seller, is <laughs> selling to a male, selling to a female? I mean, yep. just going to go down the list, right? Exactly. And and so, yeah, I, I love what you're saying, because I think it's it's a good lesson for people to learn. It's just that it's got to be your own person mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at all times. got to be your own person. Yeah, and we try and coach that. So one thing that we focus on here is we have like a really good uh, onboarding path where we teach really strong fundamentals. But part of our process is to really identify like what you as an individual seller are strong at. Because the things that I was foc- that foc- I focus on as a BDR, SDR, my other top performers may or may not be focused on that. But like part of being a great seller is like really understanding the fundamentals and knowing your identity and marching towards that path. And um, honestly, the people that are constantly searching, it's more so because they just haven't identified what their actual identity is, as opposed to the ones who already do know that and they're winning and, and producing great ways to win because they already know who they are. Yeah, well, I, I agree. And I think the only caution I'd add to that is just that that changes as mm-hmm. you mature and grow. Um, I couldn't have explained why I was successful as a you know, 24-year-old seller or as mm-hmm. a 26-year-old sales manager. It probably wasn't until <laughs> I was probably in my late 40s that I really <laughs> had a good handle on that. But, but, but it kept changing because mm-hmm. the environments I was working in kept changing. Mm-hmm. But as long as you're trying to be self-aware about it, and I think that's really the critical thing, is as long as you're trying to be thoughtful and self-aware about how you sell, where your deficiencies are, what you need to improve on and constantly work on, Mm-hmm. then that's that's the path you need to go down. Completely agree. Completely agree. All right, Ernest, we have to jump off. It's been fantastic. Um, so if people wanted to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Sure thing. So you can find me on LinkedIn, very active on LinkedIn. <laughs> so my name is Ernest Awusu. Go, go start me there. You will also find me on Twitter, the Ernest Awusu. The reason we say the Ernest Awusu is because you go into Twitter and search it, you will see a ton of yeah i'm 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 glad you got that one i tried to get the andy paul i didn't get it. i got real andy paul but yes yeah <laughs> surprising always surprising how many people have your name exactly exactly all right well good well Ernest, it's been a pleasure and we'll make sure we do this again i would love to do so and it's great talking to you okay friends that's it for this episode first of all i want to thank you for taking the time to listen i'm so grateful for your support of this program. And I want to thank my guest, Ernest Owusu, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement, with Andy Paul on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you can also leave us a rating or review, let us know how we're doing. Well, we'd appreciate that. And you can do that all on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this episode is finished. Thank you for your help. And thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.